going to put this up where I can see over it, maybe. It is a joy to be with you this evening. I thank you so very much for your gracious invitation to be with you tonight to speak on this wonderful topic. I bring you greetings from the brethren to Justin, and I, Corey, I've forgotten how many times I've been blessed to speak here, but it's been a number of times, and you have always been unfailingly gracious and, and welcomed me so well, and I appreciate that very, very much. I'm glad to stand before you this evening to affirm that there is one truth. Now, I'm assuming that when you assigned that topic, that you knew it was absolutely, totally, completely, politically incorrect. <laughs> and that's okay. That's just fine. Because I'm confident that you and I are going to stand together on this. And we are going to affirm the truth that there is one truth. And should we do that, uh, a good portion of the world will just write us off as being intolerant and arrogant and maybe narrow-minded or perhaps even closed-minded. Who knows? But that's okay. Didn't the world have some harsh things to say about our Savior when he was on this earth? They said some terrible things about him that were not true. And yet Jesus didn't let that stop him from doing what he came to do. He just went right ahead and did the Father's will. And we are the recipients of the benefit of that. And so I am going to ask you this evening, let's just be happy warriors, shall we? Let's march right on ahead. Let the world say what it will. Let's march right on ahead and just do our best to do the Father's will. Let's do our best to be like Jesus. And above all, let us not feel sorry for ourselves if indeed we happen to be reproached for his sake. As we talk about the one truth, there are some things that are going to have to be the case. If there is indeed one truth, and there is, then first of all, there must be such a thing as truth. How can you have one truth if there is no such thing as truth? That wouldn't make very much sense, would it? And secondly, that truth must be knowable. How would you know if there was one truth if truth isn't knowable? That doesn't make sense either. Uh, you could guess, I suppose, that, well, maybe there is such a thing as truth, and maybe there's one or two or nine or a hundred, who knows? But if there's to be one truth, as we're affirming this evening, then that truth must be knowable. And third, that truth must be absolute. It can't be squishy. It can't be this today and something else tomorrow. It has to be something that is absolute. Again, if truth is not absolute, then how would you know if there was one or two or a dozen? Well, you really wouldn't. And so we want to look at those three things tonight. And then after that, we will look at the question, well, how then do I know what that one truth is? Do we vote on it? Do we flip a coin? How do we determine? How do we know what that one truth is? We're going to begin in the 18th chapter of John's Gospel, verses 37 and 38, where Pilate asked that famous question that you've heard many times, what is truth? This came as a response to Jesus being asked by the governor, are you a king then? And Jesus said, yes, you say correctly that I am a king. For this cause I came into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And it was at that point that Pilate, I think he was scoffing here, implying that he either didn't think truth existed or he certainly didn't know what it was, if it does exist, that question, 
What is truth? But did you notice there that Jesus already has implied that there is such a thing as truth? Did you catch that as we read in what he was saying? He said, I came to bear witness to the truth. How does one bear witness to something that doesn't exist? I came to bear witness to the truth, but truth doesn't exist. What? That would be the ravings of a madman to say such a thing. So Jesus clearly implies that yes, there is such a thing as truth. So let's try to answer Pilate's question. What is truth? And of course, we'll begin by going to Webster's Dictionary. This case is the online version, but you can get a hard copy if you want to, and you can look there. And you will see there the definitions that Webster gives for truth. The body of real things, events, facts, a state of being the case, a fact. Look out for that little lowercase b definition where it says ideas that are true or an idea rather that is true or is accepted as true. Look out. That can get you into deep water where you don't want to swim. And we'll come back to that, uh, Lord willing, a little bit later. But that's Webster's definition of truth. Some of you, I think, have probably taken advantage of the courses in Greek that have been offered here at Keller. I hope you have. And maybe one of your vocabulary words was aletheia, which is the Greek word for truth, the New Testament word for truth. W.E. Vine, in his expository dictionary of New Testament words, defines aletheia this way, conforming to reality. Does that sound familiar? That kind of sounds like Webster, doesn't it? Reality, fact, we're going to keep coming back to this kind of thing. So conforming to reality, that's what the idea of truth is. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament gives some definitions for truth, this word aletheia, a reality which is to be regarded as firm and therefore solid. The full or real state of affairs, real events as distinct from myths, that which has certainty and force. And so we, we keep coming back to reality, real things. That's what truth is all about. Now, as we have carefully defined truth, you might be thinking to yourself, well, Joe, I got it the first time. Why are you going through all of this? Yeah, this is overkill. If that's what you're thinking, stop for a moment and realize that many, in fact, I would dare to say the majority of folks in our culture do not believe what we just said. When they look at truth, they're not looking at it from that angle. They're not looking at it as the Bible presents it. And so, yes, it should be obvious to all that truth exists because reality exists. What kind of statement would it be? What kind of nonsense to say reality doesn't exist? What? <laughs> Of course reality exists. And so when we look at truth, we're looking at reality. A state of affairs exists. Truth exists. To say truth does not exist is to contradict oneself inherently. Have you ever thought about that? Someone affirms, there is no such thing as truth. Don't just say, there is two. Instead, say, is that statement true? And then I might say, well, yes, of course it's true. What do you think? I'm going to tell you something that isn't true? What do you take me for? Well, if it's true, then truth must exist. Because you just said you know that your statement is true. Well, okay, then it's not true. Then why should I believe you? Isn't logic fun? <laughs> it really is. And I don't mean to be flippant or smart aleck when I say this, but these are things that we need to be aware of 
And we need to use this kind of reasoning with folks that don't understand what truth is and that there really is such a thing as truth. Because to affirm otherwise is to go around in circles. It, it's a hopeless situation. Yes, truth does indeed exist. Well, somebody says maybe truth does exist. Okay, I'll, I'll give you that truth exists. But you can't know what it is. What is truth? Is truth knowable? You know, when we say you can know the truth, somebody might say, well, that's just arrogant. How dare you claim that you can know the truth? You think you're smarter than anybody else? You know what? It doesn't have a thing to do with our intellect. Not the first thing to do with our intellect. But some people will say, well, it just sounds arrogant for you to say that you can know the truth. The best you can do is an educated guess. Maybe you can have a probability even. You know, kind of like forecasting the weather. <laughs> how, does, how well does that work? Uh, sometimes not all that well. Uh, I told someone several months ago, it 5%ed all over us today. What do you mean by that? I said, well, the weather forecast said there was a 5% chance of rain and it rained for four solid hours. And we got a really good dousing out of this. So it 5%ed it all over us. Uh, no truth is not simply a probability. Now someone might say, well, you, the best you can do is have a probability. Maybe you're 51% sure that something is the case, or, or maybe you're even 75% sure, or 99% sure. Is that truth? No, truth is not simply a probability. In matters spiritual, Oftentimes, truth is referred to when po people simply mean an opinion or an educated guess. Well, that's just your opinion. Uh, it's an accepted tradition. Well, in my church, we have this tradition that such and such is the case. And so that's, that's what we go by. That's our truth. You know, that's not a very good definition of truth at all. An opinion? an accepted tradition. What did Jesus say? John chapter 8, verse 32, he said, you shall know the truth. He didn't say you shall have a tradition about the truth, or you shall guess the truth, or have a probability of the truth, or an opinion about the truth. He said you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In the 17th chapter of John's Gospel, in Jesus' prayer, he said that he had sanctified himself so that they, the disciples, may also be sanctified by the truth. Sanctified by the truth, made holy, set apart, cleansed by the truth. And we've already seen from John 18, verse 37, earlier tonight, that Jesus said that he came to bear witness to the truth. And again, how do you bear witness to something that you don't know? Uh, that, that would be ridiculous to think of someone actually saying that. And so, yes, there is such a thing as truth, and it is knowable. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. He came to bear witness to that truth. Let's look at a couple of things that the Apostle Paul said along this line. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, he said, Food is to be received by those who believe and know the truth. Well, Paul, don't you realize that you can't know the truth? No, Paul didn't realize that, did he? He said, Believe and know the truth. Do you see there the, the connection between faith and knowledge? Some people think that faith and knowledge are, are kind of opposed to one another, that you have to choose one or the other. Paul did not say that, did he? He said, believe and know the truth. You have confidence. You trust something because you know that it is true. And of course, we're going to get down to the bottom line here that that's all talking about the Word of God. You believe and you know the truth of God's Word. 
In the second letter to Timothy, chapter 3 and verse 7, Paul lamented that there were some who he said were ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. The indication there is that Paul knew that people should come to a knowledge of the truth, but they simply weren't doing it. Whatever issues they had were preventing them from actually coming to a knowledge of the truth. So we've looked at what Jesus said. We've looked at what Paul said. How about something from the Apostle Peter? In 1 Peter chapter 2, chapter 1 rather, and verse 22, he said, you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. So truth is something that you can obey. How do you obey something that you don't know? Is truth knowable? If it wasn't, you couldn't obey it. You know what? You ought to obey the speed limit signs. Now, if you say, now, Joe, it's impossible to know what the speed limit is. If you tell me you can know what the speed limit is, I'm going to say that you're intolerant and arrogant and narrow-minded and probably a terrible person. Now, you would just think that was ridiculous, wouldn't you? That would be silly to say that. But you can't obey that which you do not know. Scripture tells children, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Johnny and Susie say, I can't know what mom and dad want. Yes, you can. <laughs> How? By listening to what they tell you. They'll tell you what they want. They'll tell you what they want you to do. I want you to brush your teeth. I want you to eat your green beans. I want you to go to bed. I want you to get up out of bed. I want you to go to school. I want you to take the trash out. If you can't know what they want, then you could be excused, I suppose, for not doing what they want. But you can know. You can know the truth because truth is something that can be obeyed. Is truth knowable? Someone who says, well, God can know the truth, but you're not God, so you can't know the truth. You're a human being. When somebody says that, ask them, are you a human being? Well, of course I'm a human being. What do you think? I'm a rhinoceros? What do I look like? Of course I'm human. Okay, do you know that your statement is true? The truth cannot be known? Well, yes, of course it's true. Well, then humans must be able to know the truth. Here again, is this logic fun? Yes, it is. You like it. Okay, I do too. Yes, truth is knowable. Truth exists and truth is knowable. What was that third thing we said? Truth must be absolute. Back in 1981, in an interview with the Atlanta Journal and Constitution newspaper, Dr. Ashley Montague, who is a professor of, was, he's passed away now, but he was at that time, a professor of philosophy at no less than Princeton University, pretty high-powered place. And here's what he said in that interview. Absolute truth belongs to only one class of humans, the class of absolute fools. Thank you for not saying amen to that. I quoted that statement one time in the beginning of a sermon on truth. And a fellow in the audience said, amen. And I thought, oh boy, <laughs> now what do I do? I just kind of acted like I didn't hear it and went right on ahead with the sermon, and I'm pretty sure that when it was over, he knew that uh, that probably wasn't the best thing to say uh, in regard to that statement. But that is a very, very popular idea. I wouldn't bring this up just to speak ill of the dead, so to speak. Uh, the man is not even alive anymore to defend himself, but what he said is on record. And it is a very common idea in the society in which we live. And you and I need to be aware of that. We need to be prepared to hear things like this and to deal with them 
appropriately. Oprah Winfrey said, what I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we have. There's another very popular idea. You have your truth. I have my truth. She has her truth. He has his truth. They have their truth. And all of these various truths, plural, are equally valid. And if you say anything against any of them, you're mean and terrible, and you're a bad person. Well, I'm sorry, but that just isn't the case. Remember I told you to be careful about that lowercase b part there? Something that is accepted as true? This idea of your truth, my truth, her truth, their truth just means whatever you happen to accept as true. Well, folks, that doesn't mean that it's true, does it? I accept that the world is flat. I really don't, but work with me here. You say, Joe, that's silly. We can prove that the world is spherical. Among other things, we've sent spacecraft up high above the Earth, and, and we've taken pictures, and, and you can look at those pictures, and you can see that the Earth is spherical. I accept that the world is flat. That's my truth. Now, if I said that, you would think me absurd. Would you not? I hope you would. You should, because that is a wacky definition of truth. Uh, truth simply must be connected to reality. Remember the definitions? Truth has to do with what actually is the case. And so, yes, indeed, truth is absolute. Once again, someone says, well, there is no such thing as absolute truth. That is self-contradictory. Someone says, truth isn't absolute. Are you absolutely sure that that statement is true? Well, of course I'm absolutely sure. What do you take me for? Some kind of a nut? Well, no. But if you know that your statement is absolutely true, then you must admit that one can know the truth absolutely. What other alternative is there? Yes, truth is indeed absolute. So how then do we know? How do we know what absolute truth is? How can we know for sure? Not just guess, not take a vote, not flip a coin, but how do we know for sure what absolute truth is? Well, for one thing, we can know, not just have an opinion, not just 98% certain, but we can know that God exists. You read the first chapter of Romans, how the Gentiles had perverted themselves and had gone astray from what they knew was right. And Paul points out in that first chapter in verses 18 through 20 that among other things, God has made himself known by the things that, we, that are made. His eternal power and his deity can be known by the things that he has created. So, Paul says, they are without excuse. We can know beyond any shadow of doubt that God exists. Now, the scripture speaks of the true God five times and of the God of truth at least four times. It may be that various translations will uh, have a different number than that, but at least those times God is spoken of as the true God and as the God of truth. Jesus, again, going back to the prayer in John chapter 17, refers to the Heavenly Father as the one, or the only, rather, the only true God. Only, we know what that means, don't we? That means there aren't any others, so there's just one. One true God, as opposed to many small g gods, false gods, uh, that Paul says the, the pagans worship in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 5. And so we know that God exists, that he is the true God, and Jesus says there is only one true God. 
And in the 17th chapter of John, again, in the 17th verse, still in that prayer, Jesus said concerning the Heavenly Father, to the Heavenly Father, your word is truth. There's how we know what truth is. Because Jesus himself said concerning the Heavenly Father, your word is truth. I want you to work with me for a moment from Ephesians chapter 4. You're familiar with the seven ones of Ephesians chapter 4. And among those seven, I want to bring out two in particular. There is one God, and we've already seen that, and he said there is one faith. Now hang on to that word faith for a moment. We're not talking here about your own personal belief system. We're talking about the faith, the faith that is common to us all. We're talking about the Word of God. We're talking about the Gospel. A great company of the priests, Acts chapter 6, verse 7, were obedient to the faith. In other words, they obeyed the Gospel. They heard it. They believed it. They put their trust in Jesus, confessed Him as Lord, and were immersed into Him. They obeyed the faith. Now, Paul also refers to that as obeying the truth in Romans chapter 2, verse 8, and Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. So you put that all together, you have one faith, which is the same as saying one truth, which is the same, uh, as we said earlier in, in Ephesians 4, of the one faith that Paul said there is. So one faith, one truth, they're the same thing. Obeying the truth, obeying this faith is the same thing. And so we have Paul's affirmation then, or Paul's implication at least, that there is but one truth. And we can know what that truth is because we know that it's the Word of God. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He did not say, I am a truth, did he? There's that definite article there, and it's important that we see that. I am the way, not a way, not one of many, uh, the truth rather, not one of many truths, and not a way, not one of many ways. So we go back again. And I'm not trying to pick on Oprah Winfrey here. The only reason I even bring up what she says is because she is so influential and popular. And I'm sure she's a nice lady. I, I'm, I'm not angry with her. I don't hate her. But I want you to know what she is saying, and I want you to know that it isn't right. It just isn't right. She said one of the biggest mistakes that humans make is to believe there is only one way. There are many diverse paths leading to what you call God. Did you get that? What you call God, as opposed to what somebody else calls God, as opposed to what she calls, I don't, I don't identify with that. What, what is that about? But she's saying there are many ways, and I've heard that most of my life, and you probably have too. Well, Jesus isn't the only way. Uh, heaven is like going to the top of the mountain, and there's all these different roads that lead to the top of the mountain, and we're all going to get there. Uh, if you want to go by Jesus, and somebody else wants to go by Buddha, and somebody else wants to go by somebody else, uh, Muhammad or whatever, uh, we're all going to get to the same place. What did Jesus say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. So I'm going to beg Oprah Winfrey's pardon and uh, Dr. Montague's pardon as well and say, sorry, but that just isn't right. Jesus is right. Jesus knows exactly what he's talking about. Brothers and sisters, we do not originate truth. Truth doesn't depend on you or me. Truth is truth. It's the real state of affairs regardless of what I think or what I want. I can think all day long and I can, I can really want the earth to be flat. That doesn't change the truth. 
The fact that many people used to believe that the world is flat doesn't mean that it used to be flat and ever since we decided we want it to be round, it became round or spherical. Uh, that isn't the case at all. It has always been the way that it is. Reality has always existed. And so, when it comes to truth, I can deny it. You can say, Joe, the earth is spherical. And I say, no, it's not. And nothing you can do is going to convince me that it is. I can deny the truth, or I can hide from it. I can go under my bed and refuse to come out. <laughs> if you're going to keep telling me things I don't want to hear, then I just won't listen to you. I'll hide from the truth, or better yet, I can get mad about it. You keep telling me what I don't want to hear, boy, I'm going to be mad at you. Paul asked the Galatians, have I then become your enemy because I tell you the truth? That's a bad way to go. Why get mad at someone when they're telling you the truth? Truth ought to be something that we desire and that we are happy to hear. And brethren, there is one truth. There is one truth. Jesus is the embodiment of that truth. His gospel is the true good news. His way is the true way. And we are infinitely blessed to know that truth. And again, it doesn't relate to my intellect or lack thereof. It relates to the fact that God has told us in his word what the truth is. And we are blessed to have access to that truth. Our intellectual brilliance has nothing to do with it. In his divine providence, someone loved us enough to tell us the truth. I am thankful for the one who introduced me. I wasn't particularly looking for it. Just tell you that right now. It reminds me a bit of the fellow who just stumbled across the treasure hidden in a field. Jesus told a parable about that. He wasn't looking for it, but fortunately he recognized it when he saw it. God, through his word, taught me what I needed to know, and I'm thankful for that. Tonight we love you enough to tell you the truth. If you've never obeyed the gospel, never obeyed the truth, we want you to know and to trust and to obey the truth and the life. If tonight you would confess Jesus as Lord and put him on in baptism, or if any other spiritual need is yours, we're inviting you to come as we're standing and singing the song that has been selected. Would you do that now, please?